Let's go to the book of Proverbs. Chapter 4, verse 23, and we're going to look at this in two different translations. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, and uh, we can start with the NIV. We'll start with that. Actually, if you'd be so kind, would you just stand in honor and reverence to God's word? And would you read this with me? It should be on the screens closest to you. Above all else, I want to hear you. Guard your heart. All right, I know on this side we got some strong readers. On this side, come on. Let's start again. Above, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Can we get this in the New Living Translation? The New Living Translation reads just a little bit differently. And um, it's important to read this. Let's read together. Guard your heart above all else. For it determines the course of your life. Matthew chapter 7 verse 24. Matthew 7 verse 24. Matthew 7 verse 24. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it. You see, that's what I was trying to talk about earlier. It's not just listening. Most of us in this room are able to pick up vibrations in our ears. And go into our, that's, that's not... When God says listening, he doesn't just mean the ability to do it, but listening also means to follow in, uh, to follow it. So Jesus says, whoever listens and follows is wise. You know, the same Hebrew word for listen is the same Hebrew word for obey in the Old Testament. There's an, a different Hebrew word. So to really say you are hearing God, God says, you're not hearing me if you're not obeying and doing what I said. There is no, it's the same word, Shema, the same word. So it, it could be, if this was in the Old Testament, it would probably read, anyone who shamas my teaching and shema is wise. Following is listening. Two sides of the same coin. It's like a person who builds a house on a solid rock. How do you build a solid rock? You got to dig. You got to dig. It's a discipline in just digging and uprooting. Why? And, and here's what happens. Though the rain comes in torrents, not just a little sprinkle that we're about to get. And flood waters rise and the winds beat against that house. It won't collapse because it's built on a bedrock. If anything goes wrong, it's not, we won't, we won't, we can't blame the foundation because it was built on the right foundation. But anyone who just hears my teaching, just comes to church, laugh, ooh, that was good, and don't obey is foolish like a person who builds a house on sand when the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house it will collapse with a mighty crash because it wasn't built on the right foundation lord open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law jesus i've told you and I've already shared with you that this is not the most comfortable message for me to preach on. But I also believe that no experience in my life will go wasted. And you'd be able to use even the failures in my life to bring healing and hope to other people. That you're able to turn those things around and work them for our good. So Holy Spirit, just use me however you see fit. If you bring it to my mind and you want me to share it, I'll do that to help your people. Because we want to be better. We don't want to just be hearers, but we want to be doers of your word. I didn't choose you. You chose me. I'm your servant. And I say yes to this moment and this task. Bread of heaven, feed us till we want no more. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please be seated. 
So we've been talking about your relationship with God, the four relationships you must steward, God, money, uh, time, and today I'm talking about people, relationship with people. And I'm going to touch it in three ways, dating, mating, dating, marriage, relating. Relating happens in all three, but then I want to specifically talk about dating, mating, and relating. Um, And today I'm going to start out talking about dating, preparing yourself. Um, talk about what is the purpose of dating. Although it's a, it's a cultural concept, it's not a biblical concept. Uh, it's a cultural concept. Uh, Tofumi, um, and, and, and I just love Tofumi because Tofumi, if I get something that's not clear, Tofumi going to pull me aside and say, no, I have a question for you. So I was coming out of Bible study on uh, Wednesday night and Tofumi was walking alongside me. I got a question for you. So I knew, I was like, get ready, yes. And Tofumi began to talk about um, uh, how the Bible says, you know, he who finds a wife finds a, uh, findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor from the Lord. And I just started to chuckle and I said, but you do know the person who wrote that passage of scripture was well aware that he lives in a society in which there are arranged marriages. So in the Bible, you didn't go on an app and find your spouse. So what did he mean when he said he who finds a wife? It was arranged marriages at the time. Date, oh Lord, it's quiet in here. You told me it was going to be like that. <laughs> Dating is cultural, right? Dating is cultural, but we want to have some, some biblical thoughts and, and hear what God says about dating. So my title today is Dating, Mating, and Relating. The subtitle is this, Lord, help me, I'm catching feelings. I told you this for all the lovers and friends. I feel that Holy Ghost come on me right there. I really did. All right. I have said from the beginning that the Holy Ghost is the agent of change. Would you say the Holy Spirit is the agent of change? Why? Because he is the spirit of truth. He will confront us the way we think about time, God the way we think about money, the way we think about relationships. He will confront us and our small T truth. He will convince us in the areas where we are missing God's best for our life. That's what sin is. Sin comes from the word Greek word that means to miss the bullseye. And in dating with your money, you can shoot an arrow and miss the bullseye. And he wants, he said he will convince us. That's the Greek word for convict. He's convincing you this is not God's best for your life. So for those that are dating and and we hope dating to prepare for marriage, to develop some principles for dating and picking a godly person to date. I did say this was for all the lovers and friends, right? Okay. Some of us are mating. By that, in this room, we're married. And I want you all not to make an idol out of marriage. Anybody ever had that cereal called Tricks, the cereal Tricks, T-R-I-X? Tricks is for kids. Marriage is not. Tricks is for kids. Marriage is not. Marriage is not for immature boys and immature girls. What marriage really is, is the death of a single person. You cannot take a single man's mind into a marriage or you ain't going to be there very long. Oh, thank you for that. You're not gonna, you can't take a single woman's mind into a marriage. You're not going to be there very long. Jesus said the two shall become one. Marriage is a death sentence. I'm giving up. I'm leaving my mother and my father their house. And I'm leaving and I'm cleaving to somebody else. And if you're selfish, please don't get married. Weddings can happen in 15 minutes, but a marriage takes a lifetime. As a matter of fact, and it's interesting thing about marriage because marriage is like, here's the picture. People talking about marriage. Marriage is like a screen door with flies on both sides of the screen. You ever had flies on the screen door? Some flies are trying to get out and some flies are trying to get in. Don't idolize marriage. Some people are trying to get in, others trying to get out. I text my mom this morning. I probably shouldn't have done it because I don't want her to watch this because I know I got to be really, really vulnerable. I said, Mom, how long have you and Dad been married? 50 years. 
How long have my grandparents been married? 65 years. I've been around, I've seen it. They're not perfect committed. Now it's interesting because my parents will call me and ask me advice and, and get my, and I'm like, dad, okay, dad, imagine how she may be feeling right now and speak to that emotion. Yeah, but that don't make sense. That, it, don't, it don't have to make sense. Speak to the emotion. If you speak to the emotion, you can go back later and say, you know, there was something that I wanted to bring up. What is most important is that emotion. Well, she shouldn't feel like that. It's too late. And please don't say that. Don't tell her that because she already feels that way. Emotional intelligence. It's important to see lasting, staining relationships, to see my grandfather, my, my grandmother, and my grandfather riding the car. He never allowed them to put the car in park or drive until he grabbed her hand and he prayed. Opening up doors and, and every day telling her how much he loves her. Every day telling her how he was, if I've done anything today to offend you, I'm sorry if I've hurt you today. I watched it my entire life. My grandmother traveled the world preaching. My grandfather's right behind her carrying her purse. And he would say, I'm her intern. I'm her number one supporter. So we've seen around these, these portions, these, these folks, that, that sermon clock cannot be right. Because they only telling me I got 20 minutes. Y'all better stretch y'all hands towards this and tell them in the name of Jesus. Lord, put more time on there. Because I'm, I'm, just, I'm just loosening up right now. Oh, that's the problem. It's set for 35. That was for Stephen. Yeah, give me, give me, no, 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 give me my 45. Give me my 40. I need every minute. I, and the reason why, you know, I love Bishop Garlington. I love him because um, his heart for worship, he, his worship, uh, his heart for worship and the way he worship challenges toxic masculinity that says men can't raise their hand, men can't cry, men can't be vulnerable before God. And when I saw him as a young man, I was like, that's somebody I can connect to. He was a PhD. I was pursuing my PhD in Pittsburgh. I loved him because he didn't have to give up his intellect to be a preacher. And he merged the two together. And we came out of, uh, I found out later, we came out of the same kind of background. Grew up, both grew up in the apostolic church. And we laugh and have jokes and make connections about that. But the other thing that just grabbed me was how that man loves his wife. If you've ever seen Bishop and Pastor Barbara, good God Almighty. Uh, and I forgot how many years they've been married now. And Bishop, he says that they've never talked about divorce. He said, we never talked about divorce. Pastor Barbara says, but we have talked about murder. <laughs> but they just, that man, he loves his wife. And so I've been around marriages long enough. I mean, these longstanding marriages, I've seen it. I was sharing with a friend of mine. I said, I think we might be the last generation to say our parents were married 50 years. I think we might be the last generation to be able to say that because the divorce rate in the church is just as high as it is in the world. And for some people, marriage is not a, a covenant. It's a commitment as long as it's convenient. And it's like your starter home. You're only going to have it for a few years and then I get another one. So we're going to talk about uh, marriage. I'm going to interweave that in there. Some relating. And, 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 and what I mean by relating, I'm talking about all types of friendships. Friendships, business partnerships, church relationships, many, uh, ministry relationships. Trying to help us to develop emotionally healthy relationships. How do, how do, you, how do you fight, have a clean fight when you have disagreements? Because it's going to come. How do you listen with empathy? How do you advocate for yourself? Because no, nobody can read your mind. I don't know what you need if you don't tell me. So how do we become disciplined in how to do relationships differently? I had to go back and address some stuff recently and say, you know, I apologize. I made a decision in a moment of grief. And I realize now that I should not have made that decision. I should have taken time to wait. And I'd like to change that. And I prayed and I asked God to go before me and help me. And I said, Lord, I'm throwing myself on your compassion. You said in Exodus that you are a God of compassion. And compassion, in the Hebrew, uh, the picture is the, the compassion that a mother has um, when she has her newborn baby, just loving and taking care of my newborn baby. And that's the picture, God's compassion for us is like uh, akin to a, a mother or a father with a newborn baby. 
And I said, Lord, you know, um, I know I, and I internally, I knew I shouldn't have made the decision. I said, you should wait. You're very emotional right now. Uh, going through this grief, you shouldn't do it. And I said, Lord, you know, some people would say, he knows better than that. I mean, he's got a PhD. Come on, man. I violated my own principle making a big decision when you're grieving. And I said, Lord, they might say I'm too old. I should know better. But you see me as your little baby. I said, I need compassion. I need you to help me. God worked it out for me. If I wasn't in, and, and how I started to realize that I'd made the wrong decision wasn't, I'm, I didn't make the right decision for me at the moment. I would start to feel it in my body. I started to recognize tension headaches. Something was going on the inside internally. And I have learned to listen to my body. Feelings are important. Feelings tell you something. Feelings should not drive the bus of your life, but they should be on the bus of your life. They give you information. And I've learned over years to be aware of my feelings and not ignore them. So I had to go back and make some changes. And God helped me. And not burn bridges. I'm so thankful I didn't burn bridges that I'd have to turn around and walk back across. Some people just burn bridges because they don't know how to manage relationships well. You know, you can break up, you can end relationships, and it don't have to be nasty. It don't have to be dirty. It don't, it, it, you, don't, you don't have to have that. But I want to speak to you today as a shepherd, as someone who has oversight and insight. It amazes me how, as a pastor, I've been, how I see things totally different, and I, sometimes I talk with my pastors. I'm like, man, I didn't see this before. It's like, yeah, that grace, that anointing wasn't on you. You weren't in that office. As a, as a man who's walked down the roads, many of the roads I'm going to talk about, I've walked down them. And nothing is worse than being a shepherd and seeing people walk down the wrong road. The Lord is my shepherd. And he has under shepherds to say, hey, that's, that's, that's not a good fit for you. That's not going to work out. You probably need to reconsider that. But the Lord told me, you drop the God card, I'm going to step back. And you see the wreck coming. And you turn your head. And as a shepherd, you have to be the one who you can see it and say it. This is the right way. That's the right way. You go and like, think about this, consider that. But then you also have to become the paramedics and go on the scene and help to walk the person back into healing. And it breaks my heart to see people making decisions, to hear a warning, not just from, from pastors, but also from parents, from older folks, from, 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 from wise folks. What I'm trying to tell you is that above everything else, we need to get wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to make godly decisions. And we also need to get understanding. The challenge for me is, in doing this, it requires that I that I that I'm, I become vulnerable. It requires that um, that I stand up to say, "Yeah, my parents had what got fifty years, grandparents sixty years." It requires me to say, "I didn't, I didn't, I didn't do things right." Um. I know what it is to obey. I know what it is to disobey. I thank God for the people who will be able to uh, get married and, um, and uh, say that they were married as virgins. That ship in my life sailed a long time ago. I missed that one. I missed that boat. I missed it time and time again. I missed that boat. Made poor choices made some better choices and it's interesting because in 20, 2014 2014 met a woman started dating actually got married in 2015 she asked for a divorce in 2016 um, in 2016 November 2016 in 20 16 of August is when Prophet Lloyd Buster came and he said, your pastor is going to come to pass. 
few months later, she asked for a divorce. So in January, the day that I stood up to announce to my home church that I was going to st start pastoring, I talked with Bishop Garlington and my grandmother. And in that same announcement, I recorded it. I also had to announce that the marriage was coming to an end. So when I say this ministry was birthed in pain, at the death of Anthony Nazir, absolutely, his death brought about it. But I was experiencing a death. And the only thing God knew what he was doing, because for months, the only thing that got me out of the bed was this church. The only thing that gave me something to live for was this church. The only reason why I didn't wild out, I had more money than I ever had in my life. I had more access to different things. I could go wherever I want to. I don't have to be foolish and mess around in Ithaca. I can go wherever I want to in the world and won't nobody know but me, God, and the devil, and the woman that I'm with, that's it. But it was a little too late by that time because God started building in integrity and character as I was accountable. And at that point in my life, here's what I said. God, if this, this rug was pulled from underneath me, I don't know. I did not want this. Like, what in the world? I said, I want to see you put my life back together again. And I made up my mind I was going to be the best me that I could be. How do you move on when you don't have closure? I went to God and I said, God, you're going to have to tell me that in the areas in my life that I need to improve on. And for months, nine or ten months, I drove to a church in Sayre, Pennsylvania, and attended a ministry called Divorce Care. Because my goal was to be a better person for me. And I said, if I'm a better person for me, I know I'll be a better person for my family, for my nieces, for my nephews, for the church. Begin to focus on emotional intelligence. I took the time to say, I got to make sure this foundation is right. Ten months, ten months digging, doing deep internal work. Because I said, I, I got to do an autopsy. I got to make sure the foundation is right because something is rocking. I, I got to make sure this is right. It's interesting because one of my colleagues, was. we would spend time together playing basketball, things like that, and he knew what I was going through, and one day we were sitting at Chili's eating, and he said, I don't see how you went through what you went through without wilding out. And in that moment, I was able to share with him because of my relationship with Jesus. I didn't know he was watching my life so closely. He said, I couldn't have went through that like you did. It's not that I was doing something so, so I'm so great. No, no, no. I just wanted something different for my life. I wasn't going to um, suppress the pain. I was going to process the pain. I wasn't going to numb myself to the pain with more women or alcohol. No, 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 no. I wasn't going to do it. I was not going to do it. He said, I don't know how you went through that the way you did. And I began to tell him about Jesus. And it, it, it occurred to me that what he was saying is pretty similar to what uh, the reason why Moses looked at the burning bush and walked over to it. It wasn't the fact that the bush was burning that caught Moses' attention. What caught Moses, because a lot of bushes burn in the desert. What caught Moses' attention is that the bush was burning, but it wasn't consumed. What he was saying is that I cannot believe you went through what you went through and you were not consumed by it. So I don't stand here as no perfect man. Bishop, I mean, started to tell me, look, you need to build into your life right now things that you can take into your next marriage. And he walked me through some things. So the team knows on Monday, don't call me because that's my what? That's my Sabbath. Because Sunday is a work day for me. That's the day, Monday is the day I give to myself and back to my family. He's like, you got to think differently. And I asked him, how? how how do you manage traveling so much? He laughed and said, oh, Pastor Barbara helps me with that. She would tell you, okay, no, 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 not this trip. He said, some people, they'll say, you will, I will travel for two, I will not be gone more than two days away from my family. He said, you got to start thinking about life this way. So 
I'm going to share my story in there. You're going to hear more about it. I got stuck on stupid. Stuck on stupid. Oh, yeah. Got stuck on stupid. Lord, clock is slow. I thought I was going to have five minutes. He's like, no, 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 keep talking. I know what it's like. I know what it's like. I know what it's like for your pastor to look you in your face and say, you're going to have to make a decision. Either you're going to walk with God or you're going to do this because you can't do both and serve the Lord. Can't do both. I know what it's like to get a woman pregnant as a college student for her to have an abortion. I know exactly what it's like. Mm-hmm. Bless God's goodness. And I know what it's like for God to redeem you and put your life back together again. And I know what it's like to sometimes to see your nieces and nephews who are about the same age as that child would have been and cannot help but to imagine what would my son or daughter have looked like because of a decision. Mm -hmm. So I'm not just pointing fingers at people. No, 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 no. I'm walking along with you to say I'm one taken among you and to say that God put my life together again and I made some decisions. I made some strategic decisions. Some t- strategic decisions. There's a point in time my pastor said, okay, look, you, you just got to sit down for a little bit and make a, make a decision about what you want to do because what you, this right here, you, you can't do this and be a, a leader in the house of God. They used to call that church discipline. So I want to help you. I want to help you. I was thinking about the words at one point in time as pastor. He's now gone to be with the Lord, Bishop Gregory Paris in uh, um, Rochester, sitting down talking with him in like 2005. And he gave me some wisdom. And uh, Wisdom is great if you obey it. So I had to sit down and really think about what I wanted to be, what I wanted to do, the life I wanted to live for myself. Because the principles of the cross, of Christ, are activated by a cross. In other words, Christianity don't work until your life is laid down. I wanted to know, is she the one? But I think she the one. And my grandmother said, you're not going to know until you sell out to God. You won't know until you are dead to yourself. Until you begin to think like God thinks. And I've come to realize, oh, yeah, no. Nah. The prophetic word came forth that told me to walk away because everybody's not going where you're going. Before I got in, before the pregnancy, before all of that, and I still walked the wrong way. It's amazing how hard we can pray when we get in trouble. Some people only pray hard when their period is late. told you so I'm not playing around when it comes to this because I've seen how lives can be destroyed and hurt I needed to ask myself who has God called me to be and all of that stuff so I want to talk this morning I want to talk through um, talk about dating and help, I had to walk through a critical process where I had to forgive myself and offer grace to myself and ask myself four questions. I never will forget it. How did I get in this? How, did, how do I get out of it? What damage have, has incurred and how do I get healing? Four questions that shaped my journey. I had to realize that divorce was an experience that happened to me, but it wasn't my identity. It's not my identity. It's an experience. And God used that to allow me to do some deep work, deep, 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 deep work. I took time. I took months away and, and was driving 45 minutes away. 
because it's the only church in the area that had one. And I remember they had it in Pittsburgh. And I vowed to God, I said, as soon as CCC is at the right point, it's going to be a, mi a ministry that we offer. Because there are a lot of people that's hurting. They, they were either considering divorce, going through a divorce, or had been divorced. And uh, 10 months, because I wanted to be a better person. I put the time in because I knew it would pay off after a while. And some of you all, a lot of you all in this room are in college and you're putting the right time, you're putting time into studying, you're spending four to 10 years, come steeped in the subject matter that will, your decision to study right now is gonna impact the future children that you will have. As your financial in, uh, uh, finances and, and ability increases, that's going to impact the future children that you have. Because you took the time to say, I'm going to school. I'm going to learn. Other people in business are working hard. Their decisions right now will impact future generations. And if that's true of your education, and that's true of your finances, that's also true of your dating choices right now. Yeah, I knew I wasn't going to get a few amens there. That... Some of you are just playing around and dating. Oh, we're just hooking up. As if there is this, that, that there's truth to this thing that you can have sex without consequences. But this is just hookup culture. There's nothing. I mean, we can just go like the, the choices that I make today won't affect my children. Yes, they will. Some of the battles you're going through right now, you don't know where they came from, but I guarantee your parents do. I guarantee it. Some of the struggles that you have, you don't know, like, why am I like this? How to get this? You don't know, but if they were be honest, they'd tell you, yeah, that's something that was in my life. What I believe what God wants to do is God wants your children to see in your house, in your marriage, in your relationships, what many of you didn't get to see in your house. My question to you is, are you willing to take the time to do the work. You, you, you'll do the work for a grade. You'll do the work for finances. Are you willing to take the time to do it for your heart? Some people I talk to, I talk to folks, they're hurting from their parents' divorces right now. They haven't seen any healthy relationships. So I want to speak from experience. So when you hear me make this statement, the areas in your life where you resist God the most, you will have the greatest failures. You will know where that comes from. And I also know in the areas where you yield to God the most, you will have the greatest of success. For me, it was the micro, regret, micro rejections of wisdom along the way. Like you don't just get to that point. It's the micro aggressions of wisdom. Like, they, what are they talking about? They don't know what they're talking about, and you just keep walking. And you just keep walking. And you just keep walking until you find yourself on the edge of a cliff. That's what it was in my life. I suspect in many other people's. My grandmother said this, if the great-grandmother said, if the devil can't push you back, get you to walk away from God, he'll push you forward to try to get you to get ahead of God. I wish my great-grandmother was alive because I say, and hey, grandma, I got something I want to add to your statement. If he can't push you back and he can't push you overboard, then what I believe he want to do is send a distraction and, st and steal years from your life. He'll bring your progress to a halt. And you'll be of no use to God, very little use. Because he didn't, he didn't push you back. I just want to get you distracted. 12 years, 12 years dealing with distraction, 12 years, 12 years. <sighs> Pastors walking alongside me. Some stuff, you know, I'm still walking out now and asking and waiting because, because here's what I've learned. God said that I will restore the years to you that the palmer worm, the canker worm, the locust came and devoured. God can restore time that was taken. God restores. Would you say that? Say God restores. God restores. But what I've learned is that restoration takes time. Yeah. He said, I will restore the years. He just didn't say it's going to be next year. 
because he's more interested in making sure you dig down and you hit the rock. It's built on the rock, which is his word. Some people in here are married. Some people have gone through divorce. Others are in toxic relationships right now. Some folks in the room engaging in hookup culture right now. Some people are saved and living together as if they're married. Some people are single because they have no options. Ain't nobody looking at you. Some people are single because they don't want to be married. Some people are single because they haven't found a suitable partner. Some people in this room are single because you were brave. You walked away and wanted to be a whole person by yourself rather than to be in pieces and fragments and in a toxic relationship with somebody else. That's bravery and courage. Don't make marriage your idol. Marriage is, married people are not superior. God's too wise for that. Marriage is not the prize. To be holy is the, is the prize and the goal. All of us are called to be holy, to be set apart for God's use. I told you dating was not about love in the Bible. It, was, it, was not, it wasn't about that. Dating is a, bibli- a, a cultural practice, but we need a, a biblical blueprint to govern it. People in, people in the Bible, I mean, they, it was a contract. They were, some of them were, were, you know, they didn't marry for love and good looks. Some of them were ugly and married. Some of them were broken married. It was arranged marriages. It wasn't about that stuff. Jesus' main goal for coming was not to make sure you have a spouse or a boyfriend or a girlfriend. He came to do what you couldn't do to save your soul. He is not a genie in a bottle. And some people, and these folks that says, God said this my husband, stop lying, stop lying. You use that to avoid doing the work. When people say that to me, I just watch. And within six months, they all have been broken up. It's in six months. Jesus said, the person who hears me and obeys what I said is like the one who digs, takes the time, and builds on the rock. Because the wind is coming, the rain is coming. But when that stuff comes, it won't, the house won't collapse because it's built on the rocks. Listen, marriage, relationships of any kind are hard enough on their own. But when you bring in stupidity, when you bring in, uh, uh, when you bring in poor choices, when you bring in all this, this, oh, I, yes, Lord, when you bring in this high body count, I told him if you bring it to my mind and you start comparing your spouse to the high body count because you don't do it like this person did it. Yeah. See, you created more challenges for yourself. I told you, they didn't give me my Smarties this morning, so... I mean, that's my medication, so pray for me. Do me a favor. Lay your hand on your head and say, Lord, help me to do the deep work. Take the time to become the person you need to be and to prepare for godly relationships. Here's the thing. Don't don't believe the lie that you're exceptional. I'm exceptional. This is not going to happen to me. Yes, it will. You walk the wrong way. God will not be mocked. Mocked in Greek is materazo. I mean, you're going to point your finger. <laughs> I got away. I mean, I was able to do it. Nothing. No, 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 no. You can't violate God's word and think you're going to be blessed. You, that's just not going to happen. God will not be materazo. You're not going to say, to everybody else. I got him. No, 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 no. God said, whatever a man sows, that, that you will reap. If you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap corruption. You sow to the spirit, you're going to reap life. You can't just live like you want and just hook up and think like, no, 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 no. You belong to God. The enemy don't, he's not, the enemy ain't concerned about you, you know, just getting, meeting all these people. No, 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 no. The enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy your future. He want to destroy the future family. He want, the enemy wants you to stay on stupid so the generation curse can stay in your, your life, stay in your family's life. Breaking generational curses is, it comes with making different decisions. You make the same mistakes your parents made and grandparents. Somebody in the family know where it came from. Marriage is supposed to be a picture between Christ and the church. I've never seen Christ hit the church upside the head. Some of you have seen violence in in your home. If God can get in our head, we can build it differently. Who's ready to commit to go on this journey with me? 
and, and do the deep work. I'm telling you, it's going to hit married everybody. Many of us weren't taught and prepared. You gave your heart to Jesus and nobody, and, and the most that they told you is don't have sex. They didn't tell me how to have godly relationships. In part because many of them got married much earlier than we do. Got married 20, 21, 22. So they didn't have to live single until they was 30. So they told us, just don't have sex. So they didn't equip, equip us with, uh, I believe they gave us the best that they knew, how to have healthy de- uh, relationship. So if you want to, to, to build on the solid foundation, how many people want to make sure your life is built on a solid foundation, your dating choices? Okay, good, 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 good. Then, I, then that leads me to my first question. What is the current foundation you built on? What's the current foundation? The principles for dating that you, your life is being governed by right now. This is my first point. We got to do some groundwork excavation. Let's excavate your life for a second. Romans 12, 1 and 2 in the message translation is where we're going to go. Our series started with relationship with God first, and then we went to money, we went to people and time. Let's read this. Here is what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around, dating, your everyday, ordinary life, and place it before God. Ooh, ooh as an offering. How many people still ready to take this journey? Oh, look, look, Lord. Look at the hands now, Lord. Place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Lord Jesus, you got me out here. How many still want to take this journey? Look at them hands, Lord. Look at them hands. They, they, I done lost about 70% of them. It's all right. The Holy Spirit is the agent of change. Don't be so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it even without thinking. The dating culture. Instead, fix your attention. Remember I was talking about focus on God and you'll be changed from the inside out. Readily uh, readily recognize what he wants for you from you and quickly respond to it. What was it? We were talking today about responding hands up. Respond, praise out loud, and some people's like. Notice the Bible says, quickly respond to God. Do y'all know delayed obedience is disobedience? Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. Most of us learned about dating from other immature people. We learned about sex from immature people. God brings the best out of you. And he develops well-formed maturity in you. We started out with God because we said, God, we went to money, we're on people on time. Isn't it true that you could have, I mean, you can handle money well without God? Yeah. You can have godly principles. You have principles. Isn't it true that you can have some good relationships without God? Yeah. Isn't it true that you can manage your time well without God? Yeah. So why do we need God? Because Jesus says it this way. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses soul? And what shall he give in exchange for his soul? I manage my money well. I manage my time well. I manage my relationships well. No, 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 no. What are you going to give in exchange for your soul? God helps you to rethink the way you do money, relationships, and time. That's why we start with God. Just look at the person next to you and tell you, tell them it starts with God. God and his word are one. God is his word. Jesus is the word of God. When you read the Bible, the written word, it introduces you to the living word, Jesus. When you see Jesus, he shows you the father. If you want to know what Jesus is like, you got to read the Bible. If you want to know what God is like, you got you to look at the life of Jesus. God and his word are one. His word must be the standard, the foundation for how you think about time, money, and people and about relationships. If that's the case then we got to do some excavating to see what is really the foundation. Here's another word this morning God gave me. What is the operating system 
that is driving your machine, your brain, the functionality of your brain and your choices when it comes to dating. You know, you got an iPhone, you got iOS something, that's the operating system. What is the foundation, the operating system that is governing the decisions that you make regarding dating? Is it the television show Insecure? Well, I told you I'm coming this morning. Is it Insecure? How about Love Island? How about love at first sight? All of those are trying to tell you, the world trying to fit you into its mold and saying, this is how you do it. And we do it without thinking. We do it without thinking. Maybe it's not insecure, maybe it's not, insecure, maybe it's not love island, maybe it's not love at first sight, maybe it's Pornhub. Guard your iOS, for it will determine the course of your life. Above all else, guard your heart, your iOS, your foundation, for it will determine the, the, the course of your life. Here's the thing about an operating system. It keeps updating. So now it's okay if you have, I mean, look, have 10, 10. Have one main and have nine on the side. If that don't work, just say you open. Just say it's an open relationship. And then if they say that's wrong, we're going to update and we're going to give you something else. Just kiss anybody you want. Just do whatever you want. And just in the name of tr having fun, having pleasure, exploring. It keeps updating. It keeps updating. It keeps updating. The world's operating system. The world's fine. And we just do it without thinking. Oh, we're just trying it out. If it feels good, do it. Your soul was not designed to function like that. Your body belongs to God. If you built your dating life on choices on anything other than God's word, it's sand. You're in the kingdom now, so the foundation, the iOS, has got to be God's word. The word of God must be the foundation, the ground, the core, the principle in which you make dating decisions. But this is the problem. If the Bible has got to be, the word of God has got to be the foundation, God help a biblically illiterate generation. Oh, yeah. God help a biblically illiterate generation that don't know God's word. Because now I don't, I don't even know what the foundation should be. When you move into God's word, you say, God, what, is, what are the principles in your word that I should follow regarding dating? What are the principles? Mike Todd says something that's really true. He said this, the more biblical principles you know, the less you have to pray about what to do. Should I date this person? I don't even, some stuff, I promise you, some stuff, somebody asked me. He said, I don't hear you praying about this. I said, I don't need to, because I know the principles of God's word about it. Principles simplify your life. You don't even need to know, should I be dating this? I mean, you got to pray and ask God, should I be dating? How does it, what, does it line up with the principles of God's word? I don't have to fast for 40 days, do all of that. No, 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 uh-uh. I have the principles of God's word, which is the foundation. I preached a message called Don't Let Him Get in Your Head a few weeks ago. And I gave you all this principle. Whatever you're building in life, Peter said to the religious leaders, you have rejected Jesus. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And I said, whatever you build your life on, you better make sure Jesus is the cornerstone. Because if you don't, it's going to be sand. This the biblical principles. Are you building on the rock? Is your dating life built on the rock? Is your marriage built on the principle of the rock? Is your career built on the rock? I'm not going to cut corners on taxes because my life is built on the rock. My business ethics built on the rock. Your way you raise your children, the way you do business, is it built on the rock? I know God wants to help us today. How many people want God to help you? How do I know? Because he told me to preach this word. I, I, I probably wouldn't have never done this. Not for a while. He told me to preach the word. 
And it take my time and preach it. I know next week is Palm Sunday, but I'm coming back here and going to talk about it on another level. How do I know he wants to help us? Because he sent his word to heal them. He sends his word to heal. The Bible says this, the entrance of his word brings light. Psalms 139 and 119 and 30, the entrance of his word brings light. Say that, the entrance of his word brings light. And when light comes, it dispels what? Darkness. Beginning, God created heaven and earth, and earth was our form of void, and darkness was upon the face of the earth. And what was the first thing that God said? Let there be what? Light. And light, in the scripture, wherever there's darkness, God sends light. God wants to send light wherever there's darkness. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. Can you go there for me real quick? I'm sorry, I don't know if I gave you that one. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. Wherever there's darkness, God wants to send light. Wherever there's darkness, God wants to send light. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shined in darkness, John 1 and 1, and the darkness couldn't extinguish it. Isaiah says in Isaiah 9 and 2, the people who have walked in darkness will see a great what? The people who walked in Hoshek in Hebrew will see a great light. You know what Hoshek in Hebrew means? Ignorance. The people who walked in ignorance will see a great light. He sends his word and the entrance of his word gives what? Light. Your biggest enemy is not sin or the devil. Your biggest uh, uh, enemy is ignorance. Your biggest enemy is not sin or the devil. Your biggest uh, enemy is ignorance. Because wherever you are ignorant, whatever area, money, time, people, relationships, dating, whatever area you're ignorant in, that's going to be the devil's playground. That's going to be the devil. Oh, and he'll let you get on a swing. Whoo, have fun on the playground. And he's going to bully you and pull it right from under you. He's going to let you go on the playground. Yet make all the choices you want. Come on down the slide. Do your thing. I'm going to catch you and move out of the way. Wherever there is ignorance, that's the devil's playground. And you can be ignorant in a marriage. You can be ignorant around money, around people. The people that sat in hokshma, ignorance, will see a great light. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. This is Jesus in John 1. You have to go to the school of the word. This is why the Bible says, in all you're getting get an understanding and wisdom is the principal thing it's the ability to make godly decisions can you go to second corinthians 4 and 4 in the new living translation let me just show you this y'all we doing all right yeah. doing all right second corinthians chapter 4 verse 4 Let's, look look at this satan who is the god of this world has blinded the minds of those who don't believe they are unable to see what the glorious what Gl glorious what and wherever there is no light there is what and darkness is ignorance. Some folks have made poor choices because they've been ignorant of God's principles. And that's Satan's playground wherever there's ignorance. And let me tell you something. Ignorance is expensive. If you're ignorant about money, you can make poor money decisions right now in your 20s, and you can, it can impact your 50s, your 60s, you can still be living with them. You can make poor decisions in your 20s about your health, and you're going to have to pay that bill at some point in the future. You can make poor decisions about dating right now, and it can impact you for the rest of your life. But I'm so glad we serve a God who will send his word to us, and the entrance of his word gives us light. He comes to heal us where there's been darkness because his entrance of his word gives light. So I started to pray and I was like, God, what we got to do is you got to say, Lord, renew my mind. I got to bring my whole life to you as a sacrifice. Some people sitting up here right now like, oh, I mean, this, I'm not doing this. I'm not talking. I, I, I want to have control of my life. You know what? You get to have control of whatever you want. But when you bring it and you yield to God, 
What God has for you is far better than anything you can imagine, think, or want for yourself. You cannot violate God's word and it turn out right according to what God wants for you. So you got, I wanted to ask you, what's, your, what's the groundwork? What's the groundwork? What are the sources that have been feeding you information about dating? Major choices. And I want to ask you, how's that working for you? If it's not built on God's word, it's got to go. And y'all just raised your hand and said, Lord, I want you to help me. You said, I want to go on this journey. You know what you did? You requested an iOS update. He was like, okay, I need a new, I need a new system. You know when you, 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 uh, you, they tell you there's a new update, and the first thing you do is you request it? Anybody? You request the update. And then the next thing, I wrote it down. I make sure I, didn't, I get it right. Then it'll say it's downloading the update. You know what prayer is? Requesting an update. And you know when God sends his word, you know what that is? Downloading the update. Downloading the new system. And when you move from one iOS uh, number to another, it has to totally erase the earlier one. And on this journey, you know what we're going to do? We're going to erase the earlier foundations. Erase them out of the way. We've, 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 we've requested it. It's downloaded. And then there is a time where you leave your phone plugged up, and you see that little white bar. And what does it say? Installing update. Some folks just need to take a, take a time out from dating to say, I got to get myself right. I got to know who I am. I'll never be able to find a helpmate that's suitable for me is what Adam said. Suitable, which means of the same kind, if I don't know who I am. God brought every animal in front of, in front of uh, um, Adam. Monkeys, giraffes, baboons, everything. Every creepy thing that creeps on the ground, everything. And Adam said, you're this, you're this, you're this, you're this, you're this, you're this, you're this. He had such self-awareness of who he was as the son of God that when Eve came in front of him, that's the suitable help me. I know who I am in relationship to God first. Then I'm able to say, that's suitable for me. Knowing who I am, because most people date at the level of their self-esteem. I haven't even gotten to point number two. I had three. Oh, boy. I told you the principles of Christ are activated by the cross. It doesn't work until you lay down your life. You can't try Christianity out like you try a pair of shoes. You get them on Amazon. If they don't fit, you send them back. You can't treat this as an option. It only works when the believer is fully submitted to God and submerged in the culture of Christ. Are you willing to take the time to set up a godly standard for your life to build on the rock? Because if you look at the groundwork and the groundwork isn't right, the next thing you got to do is go to the graveyard. And when you go to the graveyard, you have to give up what you have in mind about dating. And you got to bury it. You got to bury it. You got to say, I need something new. I need something new. You got to bury it. You got to say, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't live my life like that. I got to bury what I have in mind and what culture taught me, what friends taught me. I got to bury it. You got to give up what you have in mind if you're going to receive God's, God's update. During this time, God might take you. You can help me. I'm close here. The wilderness serves a purpose. Wilderness serves a purpose. God will often take you through seasons of wilderness-like experiences to expose the deep-seated rebellion in your heart. To expose the deep-seated rebellion in your heart. Some of what I'm saying is not new to some people. God already told you, that's not for you. That's not how you live your life. You are a blood-bought, spirit-filled believer. We don't do it that way. He already told you. You got to make up a your mind and say, I'm going to give up what I have in mind. I've been dark in this area. I don't know how to do it. I, know, I, I mean, 
I've been learning from memes on Instagram, from Snapchat, from TikTok about dating. That's where I get my advice from. God said, you got to give all, take that to the graveyard. Bury it. Take the time, that's what we're going to do. Take the time to build your life on the foundations. Relationships are hard enough. And you want to consciously bring in all these, this poor decision making. We want to constantly do it. I believe that some people in this room want better for their lives. Learning from experience is not the best teacher. Learning from somebody who had the experience is. Thank you for that, Coach. If you do something dumb with your money and you go bankrupt, I don't want to go, I don't want to have to do that and go bankrupt to learn I shouldn't do it. I will learn from your experience. And when people are telling you, look, this is God's word. This is God's word. You shouldn't walk that way. And be like, nah, I'm, I'm all right. I, I'm going to do, do it my way. It's foolishness. You're not exceptional. It's going to happen. It's not going to turn out right. It's not, the, the enemy is trying to steal, kill, and destroy your future. You got to give it up. During this week, some people got to go to the graveyard and be like, God, I'm laying this stuff down. I, 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 need to, I need to take some time and think, how do you, what are the biblical principles upon which I should build my life? I'm going to give you one. Can I have 10 more minutes? Yes? Good. Here's this one. I told you, you have to do the groundwork, go to graveyards. When I say go to the graveyard, I mean you got to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The old way has got to die. The old way of thinking, the graveyard, you're thinking about it. Some of you, you gave your heart to Jesus, but your head is still in the world. That was the biggest challenge God had got. God could bring three million people out of Egypt in one night, and it took them 40 years to get Egypt out of their heads. You out, you saved, but the way you think, you fitting into the culture of the world. Here's what I'll leave you with. You got to guard your heart. You got to guard your heart. Here's a statement Pastor YPG, YPJ said, and it's really good. Whatever you are willing to invest something of value or significance, time, talent, treasure, into that, you will connect to it. If you invest your time, your talent, or your treasure into it, you will connect to it. When you're not invested, you won't connect. So if I'm spending time with the wrong people, guess what? I'm going to connect to it. If I'm spending my money and taking out the wrong people, or they're taking me out, guess what? I'm going to connect to it. You can't connect to the wrong people. Take a chance with your heart and hope for the best. You're too precious to God. You're too precious to yourself. Satan want to destroy your, your, your dreams, your soul. God's word must be the guard for your heart. Now in the Bible, the heart is a source of, in Proverbs 4, it's the source of attitudes, actions, and words as well as thoughts. Heart in the scripture is not about emotion alone. It does include emotion, but not about emotion alone. In Western society, we think it's all about emotion. No, no, no. It's about your thinking, your will, your deciding, your inner consciousness. If you get a chance, read Proverbs 4. It mentions about nine body parts. The ear. It mentions your walk, your foot, your eyes, your mouth. But it says, above all else, guard your heart. Because your heart is the depository of wisdom. God's word goes down in your heart. It's where you store up the teachings of the Lord. And from there, that will determine the course of your life. It's so central. It's saying, guard this. And it says, do it vigilantly. Guard your heart. Because that's the spring of life. I can't connect my heart to everything and everybody. Because out of it flows the direction of my life. 
your heart is a reservoir. Your heart is a reservoir. Right outside, um, right outside this room is a little water fountain. And that water fountain, if you go there and you fill it up, that water is coming from the six mile creek watershed. That's where the water is coming from. And it's been coming, uh, the city of Ithaca draws water from there for the past 100 years. It's a reservoir. If that water gets polluted and dirty, it does no good to change the pipes and the valves because the pipes and valves won't fix that because the reservoir is dirty. Guard the reservoir. Guard your reservoir because right there is where your life is going to determine the course of your life. Some people want to replace God's word with their words in your heart. They'll say whatever they want to say to get, in, to get into your heart. You can't go there. Guard your heart. God's word is being spoken into you right now. And the person next to you, they might be don't you got to do that. I believe it. Guard it. Guard it. Reject them. Reject them. Guard your heart. And let me talk about heart in terms of emotions. The desire for companionship and love. Never forget Bishop Harris told me this. Son, you got to lead with your head and not with your heart because your heart is stupid. It just want to feel good. It feels good to get good morning text messages. It feels good for somebody to tell you how beautiful you are. It feels good for somebody to tell you how... Okay. I can't invest my time there because if I invest my time, I'm going to get connected to it. There are some things that we love that will literally kill us. Some people that we're chasing after don't mean no good. You got to guard your heart. The standard cannot be, but they said they love God. Yeah, they'll say anything. They said they love Jesus. And guess what? Demons believe there's one, there's one God. You know, th that's the bare minimum. The demons said, Paul, I know and Jesus, I know. That can't be your default position. Can't be. I was talking to someone. I was thinking about this. I said, what, what makes a good church? What draws you to a church? Me, I need a church that prays. I need a church that believes in the Holy Ghost because everybody in these days don't believe in the Holy Ghost. A church that, that you, there's going to be community. There's accountability. Because here's what I know. Spiritually mature people have accountability. Spiritually mature people have accountability. When I'm dating someone, my pastor can call me up and say, hey, how are things going with y'all? Because he knows about it. He knows about it. Because Satan and sin thrives in darkness. He knows about it. I want a church that prays, that believe in the power of prayer, accountability, fellowship, good word. I started writing down things that I want, what, what makes a good church for me. And I said, you know what? That's what's good for me. That's, what, that's a good fit for me. Because those are things that I value. And I said, I should not want in a partner anything less than I want in a church. I don't want anything in, in a partner less than what I want in a church. Because here's the thing. There are a lot of good churches around, but not everyone is a good fit for me. Not everyone is a good fit for me. We all preach Jesus, but they said they're Christian. That's right. Okay. That can't be your default. Demons believe that. It may just may be a good looking demon. So we're going to do some excavating. We're going to do some foundation digging, planning. Now I'm asking questions about like, who are you accountable to? Not are you saved? Who's discipling you? Who's discipling you? 
who's mentoring you? Who's discipling you? Jesus told us to go and make disciple. Discipline and disciple, those come from the same uh, etymological root. Disciple is a disciplined one. It's hard enough for me to fight my own flesh. I can't fight yours and mine at the same time. Like you got to have some control. I'm going to stop there. Oh, one more thing. Here's the other tidbit. I promise you I'm done. Guard your heart. If you don't pass my default, I mean, I, I'm not even trying to get your number. You, we, uh -uh. Do, 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 do. Are you safe? Do you love God? Do you know God? Are you a disciple? Where are you serving? Who can vouch for you? Who are you accountable to? How long have you been walking with God? What is your prayer life like? Things that I value. Because here's the thing. If I took the time to become that person, it is not unreasonable for me to believe God for that person. All, a lot of us are trying to ask God for somebody we haven't even become ourselves. Who did I say was the agent of change? Okay, stop trying to change people. Stop trying to change them. When they show you who they are, believe them. The Holy Spirit is the agent of change, not you. Not you. Not you. I was sitting at a restaurant. Uh, a friend asked me to just meet someone. Carlo, <laughs> Carlos came in the same restaurant and saw it, sent me a text. He's like, I see you, Doc. I ain't wanna, I ain't wanna disturb you. I was like, oh man, that's fine. That's it was just, just, just to meet, just to meet and greet, not, not like that. And I sat there and I was like, Jesus, this woman is fine. I'm to be honest. I mean, I'm saved. I ain't blind. And somehow the conversation turned about faith. So I just let it roll. And I just asked her about her faith and stuff like that. And she started articulating some new age and spirituality. And I just sat there. I said, okay. I didn't quote one Bible verse. I did not say, well, you know, I mean, that, that's not biblically. I said, that's you. I was not going to invest another platonic lunch meeting. Because if I invest too much of that, I'm gonna wanna connect to her. I ain't trying to check, look, I'm not trying to, to, to date a project. I'm not taking on a project. No, 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 no. Uh -uh. I'm not taking on a project. Not in a, ro not in a romantic relation. No, no, that's we'll move towards marriage. No, no, no. You know, as a pastor, I'm always helping people to build themselves up. That life, that, that aspect of my life, no, no, no. You, you got to be built up to a certain degree. And here's what I had to learn. I had to stop trying to save people. I can save people out here. I'm not trying to save somebody I'm, I'm, I'm interested in. I stopped going. I mean, I, I was like multiple times. I was like, yeah, no, I'm not doing that. I can't do that again. And she's too fine. And when people show you who they are, believe them. The, the Holy Spirit is the agent of change, not you. So what did I do? I picked up my coat and my hat. Stop trying to change people. They'll come to church with you. They will. Until they get you. And they're going to walk right away. Because they don't want Jesus. They want you. Stop trying to change people. The Holy Spirit is the agent of change. Sometimes you got to be like, Lot, 
You got to come out and you can't look back. Because if you turn around a lot, your heart is going to connect to the city. And whatever you invest in, you're going to turn around and connect to.